Today's Encore. Ah, uh, cool. The stories behind the songs. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Here's iHeartRadio's Miles Galloway. Dun, 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 dun. Was it a cello or a violin? Hopefully we're about to find out. I'm Miles Galloway and this is the story of Coldplay's Viva La Vida. I don't know why I asked, I can't play either of them. By the time 2008 arrived, Coldplay were arguably the biggest rock band in the world. The lineup of Guy Berryman, who? Johnny Buckland, who? Will Champion, hmm? And Chris Martin, oh yeah, had won multiple Grammy Awards, even more Brit Awards, and the heart of Oscar-winning actress Gwyneth Paltrow, who married the band's frontman in 2003. That's a lot to brag about. With their uplifting, emotionally charged soft rock, Coldplay quickly established themselves as heirs to U2. And like their heroes, Berryman, Buckland, Champion and Martin met in school at the University College London in 1997. From there, the four musicians quickly found chemistry and impressively scored a record deal with Parlophone just two years later. From the release of their debut album Parachutes in 2000, the band caught lightning in a bottle. The album's wistful second single, Yellow, was an international hit, earning a Grammy nomination and topping the charts in Iceland. That's right, number one in Iceland. Their second album, 2002's A Rush of Blood to the Head, elevated them to the next level, selling more than 17 million copies and netting them three Grammy Awards. Coldplay were no longer the little Brit band that could. They were the big Brit band that did. Singer Chris Martin was now a bona fide heartthrob, but he wasn't on the market for long. He met Gwyneth Paltrow on tour, and boom, one year later they were married. After that, life and touring slowed things down a little for Coldplay, but in 2005 they returned with their third album, X and Y. Although it didn't show much progress creatively, the album once again sold kajillions of copies and gave us the mega ballad, Fix You, which Martin wrote for his famous wife after her father died. The song became a universal tearjerker, appearing on almost every single TV show at the time. I'll never forget that moment in the OC. As well as Steve Jobs' funeral in 2011. Years later, it would be covered by BTS, Ed Sheeran, and Camila Cabello. You could say it was a hit. X and Y closed the book on what guitarist Johnny Buckland would call Coldplay's album trilogy. He told Rolling Stone in 2008, We felt like the first three albums were a trilogy, and we finished that, so we wanted to do something different. Coldplay were in no rush to make their fourth album. The band were enjoying some time off after they finished touring X and Y. A rumour even circulated that they were taking five years off, but that was quickly debunked by the record label. Still, Coldplay knew they had to come back with something better than ever. Speaking with much more music, Chris Martin explained how they felt an urgency this time around. So it is our last shot at the big time because... Um, it is, you know, we're like Rocky and Rocky IV... <laughs> You know, we're not talking Rocky 2 anymore. But particularly at the moment, we we really kind of feel hungry and like we have, like we've got given a job of being a big band and now we have to sort of try and be a, a better one. The band found a new studio converting an old bakery squished between an estate agent and a restaurant that they could use both as a headquarters and a space to rehearse and record. They called it, funnily enough, The Bakery and felt these new surroundings allowed the band to start over from scratch. I think if we l lost that connection, which we started to a little bit, then everything else falls apart, you know? If we, know, if we think that we're playing well together, and then, then everything else will tend to be good. And we, it took us six years to realise that the best way to do that was to just to get a little room and have Will and Guy paint it and just play in it, you know? It's, cool. it's not rocket science, but we thought it might be. Taking a page out of U2's book, the band hired Brian Eno, the father of ambient music, to co-produce their next album. Known for helping artists like U2 and Talking Heads expand their sound, when Coldplay first asked the producer what they should do differently this time around, he was, well, brutally honest. In a 2008 interview with Rolling Stone, Chris Martin recalled how Brian Eno didn't hold back, saying, quote, Your songs are too long and you're too repetitive, and you use the same tricks too much, and big things aren't necessarily good things, and you use the same sounds too much, and your lyrics are not good enough. Ouch. They seem to agree. Again, telling much more music. I think we were in danger of repeating ourselves. Like repeating yourself, saying yeah. it twice. I think we were in danger of repeating ourselves. You don't want to be repetitive. You don't, you don't want to say things again when they've been said once. It's just gets redundant. Or again. It's redundant. It's yeah. just repetitive. What were you saying? Uh, 
You're saying we didn't want to do something. Yeah, we didn't want to copy what we'd just done before. Right. Um, because it, it's, it's boring for us and it's boring for everybody else. Eno teased the album early on, telling the BBC it will be, quote, very original and very different from what they've done before. A lot had to do with Eno opening the band up to new ideas and helping them hear their music differently. Martin told much more music about the way in which Brian Eno works and that he thinks of him as some type of magician. Um, he's obviously the most talented person we've ever worked with. And we were saying this morning that often when he plays you the bit he's going to play on the song, when it's on its own. When it's on its own, you think, why are you such a legend? I don't understand. <laughs> it's it, <laughs> awful. That's the worst <laughs> keyboard sound I've ever heard in my life. And he'll say, just trust me. So you play it, and he plays his part, and then it, it's immediately apparent that it's the thing that makes the song good. Right. I don't know how he does it. It's crazy. But Eno wasn't the only producer they brought in to work with them. Eno was the ideas guy, but they needed someone else who could force them to do the grunt work and tell them what they needed to try harder. While chatting with Wynn Butler of Arcade Fire, Chris Martin learned of Marcus Drabs, who just finished producing the Montreal band's second album, Neon Bible. Butler told Martin that Marcus will kick you into shape. It turns out he wasn't kidding. He helped establish what Martin would call a military boot camp style of working in the studio. We, when you have a producer like Brian Eno, <clears throat> he's kind of the good cop, and you, you do need a bad cop as well to kind of drill you and break you down mentally. So that's what Marcus did for us. So it's unfair, because in interviews we're always talking about how fun it was to work with Brian, because we don't want to talk about how miserable it was <laughs> to work with Marcus. If you only could have known. <laughs> but the truth of it is, is that, you know, it's the hardest role in the world is to be that producer that says, you're just not good enough. G go back in there and do it again. Yeah, a take was no good, you're flat. Do yeah, I mean, and he does that, and that, you know, we really salute him for that, because... It's not an easy thing to do. And you don't get any credit at the right. end. <clears throat> so I'm saying now, I'm giving Marcus the credit for being a total bastard. <laughs> <laughs> and making us work harder. Coldplay listened to their producers and took the steps to change. They got inventive with their music and began working outside of the box. They built their own piano to play, added Spanish flamenco, hand claps, and stole the drum beat from Justin Timberlake's Cry Me A River for the song Lost. But Martin felt his voice wasn't up to snuff. He tried singing in different registers and quickly realised he needed a voice teacher. In 2008, Martin told Much Music, We have a singing teacher called Mary who's this very lovely, slightly crazy, but brilliant singing teacher. And she looked at me one day in a lesson and she went like this. I'm a bit bored of the way you sing. You're kidding. <laughs> I promise. And uh, I said, well, but, you know, we've sold millions of records she said but well, doesn't impress me <laughs> and she said what you need to do is sing low so i said okay and that's what happened coldplay wasn't just looking to change the music itself they wanted to change everything including the way they looked i'm not talking about plastic surgery but they did want to change their style they called up friend and fashion designer stella mccartney and asked for some ideas what they ended up with was a vision that merged salvation army thrift finds with military type uniforms it's a vibe they hired a tailor in Norway to design the jackets and pants, which they then souped up with ribbons and piping. Will Champion would later apologise to Paul McCartney on television at the Grammy Awards for blatantly recycling the Sgt. Pepper outfits. It's a little nerdy, but we turned into seamstresses for a few days, Martin told the LA Times. It's a nice feeling to wear clothes you really had a hand in. It's the closest we'll get to rock aware, I think. It's not an original idea, but it's a good one. The Clash did it, and Green Day did it, Adamant, lots of people. It makes you feel more like a performer. And boy, did they ever wear them. In publicity photos, music videos, just about every concert they played, Coldplay wore those uniforms like they were actually in the military. It was all part of their plan to emerge as a different band. I hope they washed them in between. Coldplay named their fourth album Viva La Vida, or Death and All His Friends. Try saying that fast five times in a row. You can't. I can. Viva La Vida or Death and All His Friends. Viva La Vida. Okay. I can't. The title was inspired by Mexican artist Frida Kahlo and her painting Sandias con Leyenda, Viva la Vida, which when translated to English means watermelons with legends, the life lives, or as they intended to use it, long live life. The album cover, however, did not feature watermelons. Instead, they used the famous 1830 painting by Eugene Delacroix 
titled Liberty Leading the People, which depicts Lady Liberty leading the French Revolution of 1830 that saw the defeat of King Charles X. Both the album's title and artwork evoked a triumphant spirit that Coldplay would channel in their music. The album's first single, Violet Hill, was named after a street near Abbey Road as a tribute to the Beatles. Just like they intended, it sounded different. The song featured multiple time signatures, a bluesy, fuzzed-out guitar riff, and turned out to be Coldplay's first-ever anti-war protest song. As far as singles go, it didn't sound like a hit because it wasn't a hit. But a couple weeks after its release, Coldplay teased another single, an abbreviation of the album's title, Viva La Vida. And this one sounded really different. Piloted by a majestic string section, the song avoids any traditional rock song structure, incorporating a timpani and sitar for dramatic effect. The lyrics, well, they were unlike most songs you'd hear on the radio. According to Martin, the song is about a tyrant who has lived an eternity and now realise he is powerless and will be kept out of heaven. At first, Coldplay weren't convinced it would be a hit either. Martin told Absolute Radio that the band worked on many different versions of the song before they were happy with it. In the same interview, Martin called Viva La Vida the song he's most proud to have written, but also joked that the song could be a U2B type. Could be a U2B side. Well, which is it, man? Coldplay had big plans for Viva La Vida's commercial release. They made two music videos with different directors, both of whom are considered legends in their field. Hype Williams, arguably the most influential hip-hop music video director of his time, shot the band as if they were inside the Delacroix painting from 1830. It's really just the guys in Coldplay performing the song with a cracked oil painting effect, but it proved to be the one that found its way into rotation on video channels. The second video was directed by Anton Corbin, best known for his work with U2, Nirvana and Depeche Mode. Chris Martin stars as a king wandering the streets of The Hague, Netherlands, carrying Delacroix's painting, looking rather noble and lonely, until his bandmates join him by the seaside. This version was an obvious tribute to another one of Corbin's music videos, the 1990 classic Enjoy the Silence by Depeche Mode, in which the frontman Dave Gahan also walks around in a crown carrying some artwork. They say imitation is the most sincere form of flattery, so I guess Corbin was flattering himself? In any case, both videos for Viva La Vida looked expensive and carried a certain air of pomp to them. Coldplay felt they needed to pull out all the stops for the song, so they did something they agreed they'd never do. They allowed their music to be used in a commercial. They expressed their hesitation to do so with much more music's Matt Wells. What about the idea of the way you carry yourselves, whether it be not lending your songs to an ad or the charities that you, you work with? Yeah. Right. You just said something very important, and you'll never know what it was. <laughs> Ad. You just changed our lives with one tiny little comment. Ad? Lending your music to Ad? Yeah, this is very important. Tell me why. Because it's important that we don't do that, right? Yes. Right, so you should tell our manager. <laughs> oh, he wants you to do it more? <laughs> <laughs> what's, what's just happened? What happened before this interview? <laughs> Nothing, but that's a very important point. And so Viva La Vida appeared in an ad for iTunes, featuring the band in the shadows performing upon a canvas of exploding colours. It proved to be a massive campaign for them, much how it was for fellow artists like Feist, Eminem, and Gorillaz, who also shot iTunes ads. Now, I can't say for sure, but I do wonder if saying yes to that ad had anything to do with the fact that the company Apple shared the same name as Chris Martin's daughter, also named Apple. Coincidence? You tell me. Actually, never mind. The world doesn't need any more conspiracy theories. Upon its release, Viva La Vida was an instant triumph, reaching number one in the UK and the US. Both a first for Coldplay. In fact, it was the first song by a British group to reach number one on the Billboard Hot 100 since Wannabe by the Spice Girls back in 1997. That was the same year Coldplay met at university. At the 2009 Grammy Awards, Coldplay were one of the night's big winners. Viva La Vida won both Best Pop Performance by a Duo or Group with Vocals, as well as Song of the Year, which the band described as incredible upon accepting it. They also won Best Rock Album for Viva La Vida or Death and All His Friends, despite admitting that they aren't the heaviest of rock bands, more sort of a limestone kind of rock, a little softer but just as charming. Viva La Vida up to that point had become Coldplay's biggest song, heard by fans on every corner of the planet, which may be why multiple parties accused the band of plagiarism. The first was a band from LA called Creaky Boards, who claimed Chris Martin heard their song, ironically titled The Songs I Didn't Write, at a concert in October 2007. Accusations were made, however Coldplay produced a demo of the song dated March 2007, which eventually cleared them. To be honest, I don't really hear the similarity. 
Then in December 2008, rock guitar god Joe Satriani sued Coldplay for copyright infringement. He claimed Viva La Vida ripped off his 2004 song If I Could Fly. While I can't really imagine Coldplay sitting down to listen to Joe Satriani's music, there is a pretty clear resemblance between the melodies of those two songs. In a statement, Coldplay said, With the greatest possible respect to Joe Satriani, if there are any similarities between our two pieces of music, they are entirely coincidental and just as surprising to us as to him. A judge eventually dismissed the case, but it was reported that the two parties came to an out-of-court settlement. But that wasn't it. In May 2009, singer-songwriter Yusuf Islam, formerly Cat Stevens, said that he also felt Coldplay had copied his song Foreigner Suite, though he didn't take any action. He told The Sun, They did copy my song, but I don't think they did it on purpose. I've even copied myself without even knowing I've done it. I don't want them to think I'm angry with them. I'd love to sit down and have a cup of tea with them and let them know it's okay. No harm, no foul, but Martin did address the multiple cries of song theft at a Q&A on Coldplay.com. Yes, some people are suing us at the moment, and although it was initially a bit depressing, now it's become really inspiring, Martin said. You think, right, if everyone's trying to take away our best song, then we'd better write 25 better ones. And so, just at the point where I was thinking about getting fat and becoming complacent, I've been finding more inspiration. Now we've got more to prove than ever before. A funny thing happened to Viva La Vida in the years after its release. The song really took on a life of its own as a jock jam, getting played at all types of sporting events around the world. I suppose it has an uplifting, we can come from behind and win this game feeling to it, so yeah, I totally get it. Not surprisingly, it was adopted by European football by a few different clubs as their anthem, and it became the goal celebration song for both the UEFA Champions League final and Europa League final in 2012. In hockey during the NHL's 2011 season, the New York Rangers would play the song after a victory. They won 51 games that year, so that's a lot of Viva La Vida for those Rangers fans. The song was also a big hit with Kansas City. Yes, they love Viva La Vida in Kansas City. The Super Bowl champs Chiefs played the song during every home game at Arrowhead Stadium, and the Royals would use it to celebrate home runs, which I'm guessing wasn't very often since they never really hit many dingers. Viva La Vida also appeared during a huge moment in Canada's Olympic history. The song was played during the medal ceremony for the Canadian Women's National Soccer Tokyo Olympics. Did you cry that day? I may have cried a little. I used to rule the world. Coldplay have had a lot of big moments in their 20 plus year career, but none bigger than Viva La Vida. It topped the charts in the two biggest markets in the world, won multiple Grammy Awards, and has become a song that will forever be played over and over during sport's greatest victories. As they say, long live life, or in this case, long live Viva La Vida. I'm Miles Galloway, and that was the story of Coldplay's Viva La Vida on Encore, an iHeartRadio podcast. Encore is an iHeartRadio Canada podcast. Subscribe to this podcast on iHeartRadio or wherever you get your podcasts. Download the iHeartRadio app for more great podcasts just like these.